And again, a reminder, just so you know, there's Bibles underneath each of your chairs. There's a little note sheet if you want to take sermon notes. Really great for being able to keep you keep you engaged. Um, and ultimately, it's it's God's word that we're we're here for. We're we're here to to study His word. We're here to to get to know Him. He it's like God wrote us a letter, um, and we have it in our hands. So it's just, it's just incredible. Okay, so starting off. We're going to look at where we have been, where we are going, and um, so last week we covered Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Paul, so the Apostle Paul, the author of Romans, he addressed five important points to the Jews last week um, in, in those 11 verses. He addressed the hypocrisy of the Jews, he showed that God, God judges based on truth, he reasoned that God's kindness should lead all people to repentance. He showed us that if we are not actively repenting or turning from sin, that we are actually just storing up wrath for ourselves on the day of judgment. And lastly, that salvation comes to all who are filled with faith and repentance. But death will come to those who reject and follow evil. So this week's text is just a continuation of the same overarching point that Paul is trying to make um, to the Jews that are in Rome. So he continues with how God's judgment is based on the standard of truth and how his judgment is imminent, which means that it is approaching rapidly for everyone. So Paul writes how our works, our social status, and religious acts cannot save us from this reality. So... This is probably going to be funny, but we're going to be looking at um, something that's really important to understand in this text. So if you guys are have your Bibles open up, we are in Romans chapter 2. Um, it goes, if you look at the Gospels in the New Testament, it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. If you get to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, or Galatians, Ephesians, that's too far. Those are the letters to the churches. We're in Romans chapter 2. So, it's okay if you giggle a little bit, but I need to first explain, before we get into the message, what circumcision is. So, you may know what circumcision is, and you may not know what circumcision is, uh, but it's very important that we understand it for the context of today's message. So, by definition, circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin of a male. So, circumcision literally means to cut around. So, what this is all the reasoning behind this is because in Genesis God required all of Abraham's descendants so Abraham in Genesis he required all of Abraham's descendants to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant which is also another term for a promise that God made with him and his people all the way back in the Old Testament so the Jewish people continued to circumcise their sons through all the Old Testament and now into the New Testament so Paul, and they, they found a lot of pride in this, that they were set apart, they looked different, obviously, because there was a physical change that was done to them. Um, but Paul goes into the section of his letter writing that nothing external gains us favor with God. So this includes things like baptism, circumcision, or possession of the law. The Jewish people, they had possession of the law. They knew what God's word said. The Gentiles did not have possession of the law. But it is what happens internally that positions us in right standing before him. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is the circumcision of the heart by grace alone. Then it's by faith alone that justifies a sinner and puts them in right standing before a holy, perfect, and righteous God. Jesus says in John 3.3, 3, he says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So being born again is a term Jesus uses to describe when a person receives the divine gift of the Holy Spirit for the very first time. It is in that moment that it is called being born again. Like how Jesus explained the difference of one's physical birth to their spiritual birth to Nicodemus, the teacher of the law, in John chapter 3, Paul right now is explaining the difference of one's physical circumcision and the circumcision of the heart to the Jews that are in Rome. So that's the background of what we're, what we're getting into today. So that's why today's message is circumcision of the heart. Not of the flesh, but of the heart. 
and it's going to be broken down again. Um, this text just naturally broke down into five five sections for us again. Um, and these sections are going to be those who obey are found righteous. The second one is the law is written on the heart. The third one, we're looking again at the Jewish hypocrisy. The fourth one, the conditional value of circumcision. And the last one is circumcision of the heart. Okay, if you don't get those written down, that's all right, uh, because we'll, we'll be breaking down these sections. But I am going to need five more readers again today. So if anyone wants to volunteer for reading, please. Um, I have the verses on here, or best is looking in your Bibles to be able to look. I'm going to need five volunteers, so. Okay. Trinity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Trinity. Can you take the first one? Okay, it's verses 12 through 13. Thank you for starting us off. All the sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all the sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law will be declared righteous. Awesome. Thank you so much for volunteering. Okay, so second reader. So we're going to be reading verses 14 through 16 here. I'm just going to call on whoever. Carson, you have your Bible open. Indeed, when and Gentiles who do not have the law, who by nature are things required by the law. They are a law for themselves, seeing as though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience, their conscience, Conscience is also bearing with them. And the thoughts of sometimes accusing them, at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people who grace through Jesus Christ and my, as my gospel declares. Awesome. Thank you. Alrighty. Okay. Third one. This is the longest one. I'm sorry. True, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know this, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, you, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others do not teach yourself. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who bore idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemous. 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 The tough one. Among the Gentiles because of you. Perfect. Thank you, Judah. And then Judah, I think you volunteer for the next one. Um, Judah, I Jude, you, Jude, I think you volunteer. Uh, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then if you... If those who are not circumcised keep the law requirement, will they will they not be regarded as, as those they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. Perfect. Thank you. And the final one. Well, we can well, read it. The person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly. Nor circumcision merely outward and physical. No person is a Jew who is one inwardly. The circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Awesome. Thank you so much for the reading. Okay, so again, we're, we're breaking down these, these five points. I know that was a lot of text, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break them down, um, and it's going to have a good flow with it. So the first one that we looked at, we looked at verses 12 through 13. So this, this overview is going to be those who obey the law are found righteous. So last week, I explained what the Mosaic Law was. So the first five books of the Bible, 
um, and why it was significant to the Jews. The law contained the Ten Commandments. They contained ordinances, um, how to worship um, for the Old Testament Jews. And in general, it showed Jews who God was and his holy character and eternal power. The law set apart the nation of Israel, revealed the sinfulness of man, provided forgiveness of sins through sacrifice and offerings. But ultimately, the law revealed that all people are unable to keep the law. And every single person must depend on the mercy and grace of God. So Paul writes that the Gentiles, those who did not possess the law physically or know the law of God, will be eternally judged for their sin and disobedience to his standard. So in the same sentence, the Jews who did possess the law of God will be judged according to their obedience to the law. Concluding that the reality that no matter if you know what God's law is or not, everyone falls short of this. So in basic, the Gentiles, they didn't have the law. They didn't know what the law was, but they broke it. And they would be punished for breaking the law. The Jews, they did have the law. But even though they had the law and they knew what the law said, they still broke it. Both would be punished. So an example of this is if someone is driving past the elementary school and it's during school hours and it's 20 miles an hour because the light is blinking, but they're driving 52 miles an hour and they get pulled over. What if they say, I'm sorry, officer, I didn't know it was 20 miles an hour. What happens to them? They get a speeding ticket still. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The same thing if I were in the, in the Walmart parking lot and I'm going 60. But it, it doesn't matter because there is, there is a law and there's a standard to follow the law. So to be justified, which means to be judicially, we think of like a judge. So to be declared righteous before God. So to be justified by our works, a person must obey and follow the entire law of God perfectly. They must do it perfectly to be justified by their works. And if they don't, there are eternal consequences. Doing the law can lead to salvation. So fulfilling the law entirely can lead to salvation. But no one is capable of fulfilling this. And nothing that we can do is able to save us. So this points the Jews and us immediately to our need of the gospel, our need of Jesus. So the second portion, the law is written on the heart. So why is it that every society and culture across the world, Christian or not, agrees that murder and theft are immoral? Why, why do, all, why do all, all countries, all nations, pretty much all religions, all believe in these same things? To, to not commit adultery, to not murder, to not steal. Why, why do we have all these, all these same ideas? What, what makes it different from Christianity, anything else that you're doing? Or even atheists. Atheists who believe that we're just made out of nothingness and there's no real purpose for our life, they still believe that there's some sort of a moral standard that we're not supposed to murder someone or we're not supposed to take something that's not ours. Well, this is what our world would look like if there was no sense of a moral standard. God has written his moral law on the hearts of all people. All people have a sense of consciousness of what right and wrong is, and all people have a sense of truth because God has written this on their hearts. If God did not write his law on the hearts of people, there would be sin rampant everywhere. So Paul shows us here that it's important, it's not enough to just know the difference between right and wrong, but we must do what God says is right and good. So this isn't because we won't just be judged by what other people know or what we continue to do, but it is because God knows every action and every secret thought that we have, and we will be judged by every secret action, every secret thought, everything. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows the amount of grains of sand in the sea. He knows everything, and he knows every thought that you've ever had, and your thoughts will, will condemn you. Paul writes, as my gospel declares. So at the end of this, at the end of verse 16, he says, through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. This is the gospel in which Paul proclaimed. This wasn't the gospel about Paul, but this was the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the good news of Jesus. We are unable to be justified before a holy, righteous, perfect, and just God on the basis of our works. 
It is only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ, that a sinner can be made right before God. Good works are not necessary to be saved, which is important to know, but good works are necessary to display genuine faith and fruit in a Christian's life. The third thing is the Jewish hypocrisy. So this is a, this is a lot of information, but in, in basic, in general, these verses, Paul clearly lays out to the Jews that they have failed to practice what they preach. Because of this hypocrisy, not only did it have effects on them that they, they weren't practicing what they preached, but they brought dishonor to God. They brought dishonor to the God of the Bible. People looked at the Jewish people to get their view of the God of the Bible, our God. Just like the Jews, there are people all around you looking at you to get their view of who God is. You call yourself a Christian. When you go to school and you wear that, you, you go to FCA, you come out of FCA, in the mornings, people look at you and they will, they will make up their own decision of what they think about God by the way that you guys act, the way that you guys treat others, the way that you guys carry yourselves. What do they think of God when they look at you? People's thoughts on God were based on the Jewish people and how they acted and how they lived their lives. The Jewish people were not humble, and instead they were filled with pride. They were self-consumed. Because of this, unbelievers thought little about God. And so that's why Paul says, and he, he pulls this quote back, that God's name is blasphemy among the Gentiles because of you. He's talked bad about. They talked bad about God because of their actions. They did not they did not bring honor and praise to God. That's the that's the five things. But the good works of Christians do matter. The sole purpose of our life here on earth is to bring glory to God. That that is our that is our purpose of life. It's, it's not to live a, a good life, live a happy life, live a fulfilling life. Our purpose in life is to bring glory to God as a Christian. That is, that is our purpose. That is why we are created. That is why we have been saved. That is why we have been redeemed. It is to bring glory to God. How do we do that? Well, we do that by lifting up his holy attributes. So the characteristics about who God is. So it's lifting up his grace, his mercy, his faithfulness his patience, his kindness, his justice, his mercy, his sovereignty, all, all these characteristics. And it's by obeying his commands in front of a watching world. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We are called by Jesus to be people who, when people look at us, instead of we receiving the glory, we give God the glory. We point up. It's not about us. When we get complimented for doing something good, praise the Lord. If we get complimented for the way that we look, we, 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 you look good today. Like, hey, you look handsome. Like, or hey, like I like your hair. Praise the Lord. It's not about me. If you do good on a math test, praise the Lord. It's, it's, it's about the Lord. If you do good in sports or anything else, it is all about bringing glory and praise to the Lord. Not only in how we respond that we direct that, but the way that we live our lives. And it's all to bring praise and glory and honor to the Lord. So the fourth one is conditional value of circumcision. So circumcision, the Jews, because they were set apart physically, they thought that brought them extra value. They thought the externals brought them more value. But Paul shows us in, in these scriptures, he shows us that circumcision only has a benefit to the Jews if they obeyed the law. Because it, it, only, it only makes them set apart in God's people if they actually obey the law. Because what difference does it make if they're, if they're circumcised, set apart by God, but they don't act like they're a part of God's people? It made them no different than non-Jews. And Paul writes as if it is that they were uncircumcised. That it made absolutely no difference that they were circumcised or not. 
Paul brings up a question to the Jews regarding if Gentiles, who were able to keep the law, if they would be regarded or treated as members of the circumcision. So what if people who were Gentiles, people that were not of Jewish descent, what if they kept the law? Would they then be treated as God's people? He brings up this question. It has value for someone to call themselves a Christian only if they are truly a follower of Christ. But if they call themselves a Christian and live a life that is completely contrary to the life of a Christian that is depicted in God's word, then their claim of being a Christian is false and that person is not a follower of Jesus. Just like the Jews who liked their circumcision, many people like having the label of Christian rather than living out what it means to be a Christian. I think this is something that we saw, like Kate and I saw so much at college campus, and it's also something to direct into you guys. I mean, this is just a picture of, so if someone wears a cross necklace, does that mean they're a Christian? Head shake. No, no. And so many people wear the cross, the cross in which Jesus Christ was crucified on, yet they live a life that shows that they show no honor, no praise, giving no glory to him. So really, that would be considered blasphemy. That would be bringing dishonor to Christ if you fall into that category. The fifth point was circumcision of the heart. So I'll just read, I'll read this section because this is just two verses and it's really good. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Verses 28 and 29. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So, membership into the family of God is not based on the external. Not based on the external. Being a part of the family of God is not based on the external. Going to church, growing up in a Christian household, coming to church, coming to ignite, being baptized, going through confirmation, being a member of a church even doesn't make you a Christian. None of those things make you a Christian. Those are all external. Membership into the family of God is based entirely on the internal. It is based on faith alone. It is based on circumcision of the heart. It is based on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which leads to a life of devotion to Christ, not only as our Savior, but as our Lord. Paul writes in Galatians, It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The life of an unbeliever stops when God saves them. Those are people who are members of the family of God. It is a work of God alone. Paul continues in Galatians saying right here, he continues, And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Those who are saved and born again desire to obey the law of Christ. They delight in the law, his his law. Naturally, we are fallen. And we're enemies of God. But through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to the Father and desire to do righteous things. I skipped a little bit, my bad. And yeah, so here were the verses that we just went over. But the family of God is not based on genealogy. It's not based on anything else. It's not based on our families, like our household families. The family of God is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. Love is not some mystical thing that can start and stop out of nowhere. It's not like a shot from Cupid. The Bible clearly lays out this concept of what love is. And it's important to know what the Bible says love is and not what the world says love is or what the Greek culture says what love is. Love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion leading to action on behalf of its object. I'll say that one more time. 
biblical love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion leading to action on behalf of its object. The only objective measure that we have to show our love for God is our obedience to him and his word. That is the only thing that we can visually see for our love for God. How much do we love God is based on how much we obey his commands. This may not sound exciting. It's because naturally we are sinful and we do not desire to bring glory to God. We do not desire to keep Jesus' commands. Our natural selves do not desire to deny ourselves to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus. Our natural selves do not desire to become less so that Christ may become more. This is 100% a work of the Holy Spirit in someone's heart if you desire these things. We do not naturally desire those things. These are evidences of being born again. So think of yourself right now. How are you bringing glory to yourself? When you wake up in the morning, what is on your mind? What is the first thing you think about when you get up? Do you dress a certain way to bring eyes to your body? Do you work out a lot to bring attention to your muscles? Do you practice hard to make a name for yourself on a sports team or to earn a varsity spot? Do you get good grades so that others can be proud of you and praise you? Or even making your parents proud of you? Do you seek popularity at school? Do you seek it on social media? Do you seek likes to bring all glory to you? Do you live a life in a way that brings glory to yourself? An unregenerated person cannot love God. If we don't delight in our life's mission of bringing all glory to God, then there is a heart issue. And a heart issue that you have, and a heart issue that others have. And this is serious. You must place your faith in Jesus Christ, receive the Holy Spirit of God, make Jesus not only your Savior from sin and the punishment of hell, but make him your Lord, the King of your life. Take the crown off yourself, humble yourself, and put the crown on him. Actively turn from your sin by the power of the Holy Spirit alone. We do not have power over our sin apart from Christ. And ask him, pray to him, plead with him, that he may be your guide, and that his word may be a lamp to your feet, so that you may walk in faithful obedience to him, that you may live a life that does display good works. For the sake of a watching world, yes. But for a God who, for his glory alone, chose you to be his child. It is not the external that saves us. It is the work and the blood of Jesus Christ that does. It is the work that his spirit does internally within us. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray that your word would resonate in our hearts. Lord, that we would find delight in it. Lord, that your spirit would flow through it, that we would delight in your word. We would delight in your law. That when we see what we're called to do, that we would have desires to walk in obedience, to deny ourselves, to deny any of our wants, any of our desires, anything, for the sake of bringing glory to you, Lord. For absolutely no reason at all but your own glory, you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for the sins of the undeserving, those who deserve to perish, those who deserve hell. But Lord, you made a way. You were the bridge. You were the light. You are the hope. And you offer the gift of salvation to all who place their faith in you. Lord, I pray that we would live lives that are honoring to you, that would bring glory to you, that when we wake up in the morning, we don't think about how can I get more eyes or more attention onto myself, but Lord, that we would wake up and have a heart and a desire that this life is not mine, 
Lord, you have given me life and you have given me an eternal promise. And if I believe that promise, then I better act like it. Lord, I pray for faith. I pray for your spirit to move. I pray for it to be abundant. I pray that it would enter in to the lost, to those who have hardened hearts. I pray that you would soften. Lord, you are so good. In your holy name. Amen. Okay, we're going to worship for one more song.